Hi, my name is Juanito, and today Juanito builds a four channel active mixer, and so can you. And there's a picture of me over there. I'm saying thumbs up. And then follow me at Juanito HM on Instagram. You can uh, see all my little projects. Okay. For this project, you are going to need some way of building it, the physical object. I'm going to use a can lid because my whole uh, system is based on cans. I also make other choices which you probably won't make. Like I use um, RCA jacks instead of the kind most modular synthesizers use. And I also use this kind of potentiometer that don't have any easy way to attach them to a panel. I use a 3D filament pen. This is the one I use. Um, it works fine for uh, my purposes. Um, and when you're building stuff point to point, freestyle, you um, need some way to keep the circuit from just banging around inside your module, assuming that you're going to take your synthesizer on the road, uh, or at least in a car somewhere, and you don't want it to, you don't want all the circuits to bend and touch, you know, wires touching and creating shorts and stuff like that. Um, the first step I'm going to do right now is take Gorilla Glue, or you can use E6000 or some other glue that's really smelly and stays um, flexible even after it's cured and I'm gonna smear it all over the inside of this lid that gives the filament the plastic something to stick ferociously to I only have had plastic like 3d filament um, things that I felt break once and that was in my module that has a cross fader. My theory was to make a cut in the front of the module, bend the metal over, making a little um, sort of an interference fit. I squeezed the 3D filament under that and then built it up and held the slider potentiometer in place like that. But I was whacking it like this, hitting it uh, to cross fade between the upper half of my mixer and the lower half and it eventually broke. So I had to redo it with this strategy, which worked fine, it's still working now. That's the only time I've ever had this come, um, you know, 3D filament built stuff fail on me. If you mess up, and this happened just uh, you know, two nights ago, if you mess up and you need to redo part of your circuitry that you've already put, um, that you've already put 3D filament on. You can melt the filament with a soldering iron. It doesn't, I mean, you have to clean the soldering iron afterwards, but it melts cleanly. You can separate it apart. You can kind of bend it. You can get into the pieces that you need to repair. So with that having been said, let's get into the circuit. Thank you. 
Okay, here's the circuit. Um, the magic of this circuit is this piece right here. It's an op amp. This is an op amp. Uh, I'm going to be using an NE5532. It has slightly lower noise than the TL072, but it's unlikely that you'd be able to tell the difference by listening to the two different op amps. This is an inverting amplifier. That's the best. Um, that's the best way to build an active mixer, because with an inverting mixer, every high piece of voltage comes in through the input resistor into the negative, uh, the inverting input of the op amp. Uh, op amps want these two inputs to stay the same. That's what they're sort of electronic goal is. So let's say one volt comes in here. This is connected to ground. The op amp wants to keep this connection right here connected to the inverting input also at ground. So it will do whatever it can with the output to keep this at zero volts at ground. So what it does when you put a positive one volt signal into here, the output of the op amp through the identical resistor, 20K, will be negative one volts. If this drops to ground, they're both ground. Uh, 10 4, everything's great. If it goes to negative one volt, this will put out positive one volt <coughs> to cancel out that voltage between these two, uh, uh, between the voltage coming through these two resistors. So this point in this circuit is always zero volts. It's not connected to ground. So it's isolated, uh, but it's a virtual ground. This point of the circuit is the zero point, the virtual ground point. That way you can connect a virtually unlimited numbers of inputs to an active mixer like this. Uh, there are some penalties with noise, um, and of course uh, real op amps are not ideal so there will be some distortion or slew limit uh, issues going on. So if you build a, uh, but in a practical world, I'm going to build one today with four inputs. I only drew three because I wanted to make it nice and big for everybody to see. Uh, but you can build three, two, uh, you probably don't want to do one because that doesn't make much sense. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and do a four, um, four input mixer. And, um, the 680R resistor here is just to protect the output of the op amp. If you connect this to straight to ground and tell the op amp to output uh, like you know as many volts all the way up to the positive or negative rail, it can handle it. T TL072 and NE5532 do have outputs that can handle being shorted, but to ground. But if you have this putting out minus 12 volts and somehow you accidentally plug it in something that's plus 12 volts, I'm not sure a 24 volt uh, low impedance difference on that output is going to keep this safe. The 680R resistor is just there to protect that output. I put um, potentiometers here. I'm going to have volume knobs on each of my inputs. The one microfarad resist, uh, I'm sorry, the one microfarad capacitor on each of the inputs is there to prevent what has happened in my system before, which is when you plug in a uh, module that maybe I built a couple of years ago that I didn't carefully make sure it was going, uh, that it had basically a ground um, level average. It was putting voltage into the op amp, basically pushing the um, level to the point where no other signals could get through because it was just maxing out. So you want this one microfarad resistor and the 10k potentiometer to ground is forming a high pass filter. Any DC that is present in any of these inputs will be uh, you know taken care of by this high pass filter. One microfarad and 10k I think that works out to like 5 hertz so that's alright. Uh, you're not gonna be not going to be losing any base from that. Um, okay, I think that is what I need to explain.
I gotta do a radio check. Hang on. These are my NE5532 operational amplifiers. Oh, here's a thing. When I first learned about this circuit, I thought, well, why do you need any resistors here and here? Um, but yeah, you do. You need resistors. The lowest you might want to go is, oh, geez, probably 5K. You could get away with lower um, resistance resistors, like 1K would probably be fine. But the lower the resistance of these resistors, the harder the amp, op amp has to work to cancel out the voltage between the input and the output. Um, you also don't want to go above 20, 50K because of something called, I think it's Brownian noise, um, through high value resistors like 100K, 200K, you know, 1 meg. Um, there are going to be uh, electrons banging into each other. Um, I think that's the way it works. And that makes noise, white noise, style noise. You don't want that in your circuit, especially if you're listening, you know, if you're using this active mixer to connect your outrageously high-end uh, components together. Oh, also, this is just mono. You could do two of these and make it stereo if you wanted. I'm going to be grounding out one half of this NE5532 chip because I don't have use for both sides. Here's my lump of blue tack. First, I'm going to connect. Oh, here's the diagram of these of this chip that I'm using, the NE5532. This is a standard op amp layout. The number eight pin connects to the high voltage, positive 12 in my system. The number four pin connects to negative, which is minus 12 in my system. Um, I like to connect a 100 nanofarad capacitor between the uh, negative rail and the positive rail. A lot of schematics will have it go to ground, have a 100 nanofarad capacitor to ground, and a 100 nanofarad capacitor also to ground. Putting the capacitors as close to the pins of the chip as you can is something that electrical engineers tell you to do, and I don't see any why, I, any reason why not. Especially when you're building point to point, you can have it literally have the capacitor be touching the pin at the very place where it goes in. I'm not sure that's actually better than having it, you know, close to it on the PCB. But whatevs, man. I apologize for the pop music that a kid is listening to. Justin Bieber. Still heating up. turned on this radio. Um, I realized what's happening. Uh, my soldering iron is not wanting to take it uh, melt the solder because I did use it yesterday to melt some 3D filament <laughs> and so now it has a coating of burnt plastic on it. So I'm going to scrape it off with my handy dandy soldering iron tip scraper which is a pair of pliers with a nice sharp edge. As soon as I do that, it'll get tinned real quick. If you didn't watch my other, well, okay, I'll tell you where my soldering iron tips come from. These are roofing nails, um, copper, 100% copper roofing nails, which it says on the package is 99.9% .9 purity or whatever. Copper is really interesting metal because it anneals pretty quickly and easily after a soldering iron tip that's made of copper has been, you know, in use for a while, it gets very soft. Um, that's part of why the acid in the flux, the core solder, will eat it away. 
When that happens to mine, the cool thing about being annealed and softened is that you can easily squeeze it sharp with, I guess, a handy dandy multi purpose soldering iron tip tool. Many of you will have a multi tens of dollar soldering iron rig, and that's great, good for you. Adjustable heat, all that crazy stuff. It's super great. Not me, mine costs like $3 from Harbor Freight. Okay, I've done the capacitor right there in my pre. I will go ahead and mark them off with a green pen, 100 nanofarad capacitor. Check. Now I need a bunch of 20K resistors. Here's a bandolier of 20K resistors. First, before putting any resistors on there, I'm going to make the ground connections. The non-inverting input, the plus pin, goes to ground. I'm going to make both plus pins go to ground. It's not a good idea to leave any input pins on any CMOS chip, or I guess op amp, this is not a CMOS chip not a good idea to leave input pins floating. You want to either ground them or in certain circuits you can tie them high if you like. Certain chips. And some you can tie inputs to outputs. That's what I'm doing. This negative... All right. I'm going to use this side of the op amp as my actual circuit this side. I tied this to ground and I'm going to tie this to ground and they're tied together, right? The um, this side I'm not going to use, which is this side right here, I'm going to just tie these together. The out, well, okay, so the plus is, positive, is connected to ground all the time. This is not connected to anything, so um, the out is also going to be, since they're connected together, the out is also going to be connected is going to be outputting, so to speak, a perfect zero volt level. So it's going to be also outputting ground. So this would be sensing ground. Uh, uh, fantastic, super great. Um, if this was just left floating, then atmospheric voltage from the fluorescent lights from radio stations could be getting into this chip and making the output flip out. It's going to be going high, low, high, low, high, low. It's going to be trying to keep this uh, to, you know, whatever this is sensing, and uh, especially the TL072 has very high impedance on the input chips in the neighborhood of 10 mega ohms. Um, a high impedance like that, it's super, super easy to get the voltage to change. Voltage from fluorescent lights will make these input pins fluctuate wildly. There's no reason to have half your chip freaking out trying to get it stable. It might introduce noise into the other side of the chip. So that's why you always want input pins to be connected to something. Right, that is explained. So I'm connecting the output to the inverting input of the side I'm not going to use. All right, that side's done. side, a 20k resistor goes between the output and the inverting input. So from the output to the inverting input goes a 20k resistor. If you build this circuit, Please, let me know. <laughs> My 
my usual practice with operation on with op amp circuits is to have the output be easy to access because that's usually one of the last bits of the circuit that gets built. Um, I guess when I'm doing this circuit, it might be, make more sense to make the input be easier to get to, since if I built it a certain way, I would have four 20k resistors going to that input. Uh, but this is, I don't know, maybe I should have done it the other way. But it'll be fine. I'm probably going to solder a wire to the input, the inverting input. Oh, since I'm using capacitors, there is a high pass filter right here. This active mixer, so easy, is not going to work for control voltage. If you try to put a one volt per octave control voltage style thing through here, it's not going to work. Uh, the low pass, I mean, the high pass filter here is going to block DC. Most control voltages, I mean, some control voltages are, are uh, alternating. Those will get through, like if you have your if you do an FM or something, um, frequency modulation, or vibrato, stuff like that. But, yeah, if you want to build one that does do CV, eliminate the one microfarad capacitor, and then use the other side that I'm not using to invert the signal back, because you don't want to be putting, you know, voltages from a keyboard in here and have them get inverted. So you go up the keyboard and your tone goes doo 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 doo. Uh, not useful. Interesting, maybe. Surprising, but not useful. Oh, speaking of surprises, I will talk to you as I make holes in my panel. Oh, yeah, okay, we're done. This is all the building I'm going to do on this op amp. Now it's time. Oh, let me go ahead and mark off what I put on. 20k resistor, done. So easy. Now I'm going to start working on the panel. stuff, but I cannot have sharp tools, or at least not things like saws and drills, and I can't have there be, the technical term for it is swarf, I can't have bits of sharp metal laying around. So I have to use non-material removing techniques to get my holes in my metal. So I use this little awl poke a hole from the outside and then I poke a hole from the inside or I ream that same hole out from the inside this particular tool I'm using is the same size as a small LED. So if I poke a hole in from the outside, I can put an LED through and it makes a nice little fit. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to put any LEDs in this circuit. I used to put LEDs in all my modules, but that <laughs> I just stopped doing it because it was Originally, I thought I would have color-coded modules, where all the modules that were green were going to be voltage, like uh, voltage-controlled amplifiers, and all the ones that were white were going to be filters, stuff like that. All right, so I made a hole with my awl, and then I used my Harbor Freight needle nose pliers to ream it out. This is going to be a jack. Jack. So I will get my end of jacks. If you are starting out from scratch and you're never going to build anything else besides, and you're never going to buy any modules, I recommend RCA. The 
RCA has an um, advantage in that when you're plugging things into the RCA, it's trivially easy to not touch the tip, accidentally touch it to ground. You can touch it straight to what it needs to touch. Also, it's a lot more um, robust. It's not going to accidentally pop out. They're a lot sturdier. The tips are uh, recommended. You can get the cables for basically free from anybody who ever had a VCR and now has a you know Blu-ray player with DVI or a Naughty Guy HDMI. All right, so my first hole's made. I'm going to make the rest of the holes. Maybe I'll speed it up. I don't know if I can do that. Probably not. I'll just do it as fast as I can. One, two, three. for the inputs. These are for the potentiometers to control the levels. One, two, three. Well, first you have to strip the can lid of any protective coating, which I do over the stove. Okay, first, first, you have to take your can lid like this and somehow shape it into a dome. I use the end of a screwdriver and I dent it like this. I have a little silicon heating or silicon hot pad that I stick this on and then do that. And it makes it nice and domed like that. week. No promises. I'm going to show you how to make a bipolar power supply. I have a pretty high amp bipolar power supply in my synthesizer, but I know a lot of guys out there and girls are working with 9 volt batteries or with wall warts and only have single rail power supplies and getting a synthesizer or effect to work with what did I do? One, two, three, four, one, two, three. Yeah, that'll work. To get a um, effects module or a synthesizer module to work with a single sided power supply requires getting a reference voltage down to to you know to act like a ground and um, that can make every circuit, depending on the circuit, a lot more complex or just having extra bits of the circuit that you don't really want to necessarily think about. Okay, I got all the holes poked. Now I'm going to ream them all out. This is not as symmetrical as I wished it had been, but <laughs> whatevs, man. I've gotten pretty good at knowing how big I have to remount holes to fit. Um, this is perfect. If you
you got some Sakura pens that can write on dark surfaces. The jelly roll ones, you can, oh, I usually do it down here. The jelly roll ones, you can cover with clear nail polish and they work great. But the souffle ones, if you cover it with clear nail polish, the transparency, they become transparent, making them useless. Um, you can use Mod Podge instead of clear nail polish, but that starts to dissolve the jelly roll. So I have not solved that problem yet. If you decide to use this kind of potentiometer, you'll have to deal with getting the holes just the right size. I like to try to get them perfect so that the interference fit We'll let them stay in place. You want to go like that. But I made that one too big. That'll be alright though. Because remember, I'm going to smear this whole back with my um, 3D pen. So, my solution to the coating issue to keep everything protected is just not to do it anymore. So, these pretty little designs on the front are going to scrape off eventually, but that's part of the life of a synthesizer module. It's going to get damaged, the paint's going to scrape off, the rust that I introduced with my hydrogen peroxide in a spray bottle and then salt on it is going to possibly continue, especially if I store my synthesizer in a moist environment. Ooh, I got that one just right. Look at that. Again, not a big deal. Perfect. All right, now I'm going to put the jacks in. I need four, five. Sometimes I like to color code them. We'll do black for the input, red for the out. It really doesn't make a difference. I never pay attention to the color of the RCA jacks that I'm plugging into, but it's kind of fun when you're building it to pay attention to details like that. actually building this along with me. And if that's the case that nobody is, or if everybody is and you are not, then I apologize for the amount of time this is taking and for not having any clever banter, funny stories. If you 
are building this while I'm building it. You're probably not doing it on a can lid. I used I used twice three times was a sorry like a pickle the herring snack can those are made of aluminum and aluminum has is very thin and doesn't really work in the same way as steel so when I put the jacks in the aluminum, it ended up being very loose, like it came it very quickly. The jacks kind of became wobbly. So I don't use aluminum anymore. There's a kind of beer from Japan called Sapporo in a steel can if you buy the cans and it's fine beer I don't I mean I like Japan and I like steel and it's a bare steel it's not actually bare it's coated in something so it doesn't rust but it's bare steel oh my gosh those cans are so cool looking and they are curved and if it wasn't for the very narrow end they're like two and a half inches probably maybe three inches tops on the top wasn't for their small real estate on the top, I would totally use a Sapporo beer can in my synthesizer. Alright, there we've got the three, I mean four inputs. I'm going to use E6000. This stuff is white, which is why I got it for cheap, as a thread lock. You don't want to over tighten these because you can pull them. If you over tighten this kind of jack, you can break them. Which is a bummer because they're like 15 cents each. All right. These tabs are very reliable grounds. I've never had this not be a really good ground. So you can go ahead and use those as your ground points. Um, the It's time to put the potentiometers in. The wiper in a potentiometer goes from this pin to the other pin. So whenever I'm putting a potentiometer in a circuit, I have to kind of turn it each way and try to figure out which <laughs> which one is the which one I need to connect to which part of the circuit. In this, I want this to be turned all the way down. So this pin need here needs to go to ground. connect that pin to ground. I guess I'll go ahead and be fancy and do it like this. are very reliable grounds, but they're a little larger on the physical side, so they take a minute to heat up so that the solder will stick to it, so it will get nice and wet. I assume you might have a higher wattage soldering iron than I do. Sweet! I'm going to 
plug in my 3D pen so it can heat up. If you've watched the other videos on my channel, you will know that when I have a oscillator or a filter connected to the to my bench power supply, it does this thing where the oscillator will go because the power supply is super janky. It's two laptop or actually not laptop external hard drive style power supplies that had um, positive twelve positive 5 and ground. S cheapest possible power supplies you could possibly think of. They could do that kind of watts at least. Um, but it works okay for testing. I'm never going to make a song with it. This is going to be my ground again. I'm just going to run a wire. I'll do it like that. Now, in my schematic, I put 20, I mean 10K potentiometers. I am using 50, I'm sorry, I'm using 5K potentiometers, which is also just fine. As long as the potentiometer is only doing is only handling is basically a resistor divider between an input ground and then the wiper goes to some other part of a circuit or positive to ground or positive to negative usually in that case the impedance of the potentiometer is not super critical when you're working with an inverting amplifier the impedance is important because if you have a one meg for instance, potentiometer, then the resistance between the feedback resistor and the input resistor is drastically changed when the wiper goes along the potentiometer. Um, in that case, the amount of volume change between all the way off and, and just a little bit on is quite drastic. Or, no, I'm sorry, all the way up and then a little bit down. So go ahead and try to make the value of your potentiometer in this particular circuit be less than the input and feedback resistors that you're going to build your circuit with. My pen is now warm. Heat it up. I mentioned I'm using 5k uh, potentiometers instead of 10k potentiometers. That will change the resistance um, of the resistance of the potentiometer as part of this filter. So for this one, I'm reducing this to 5k. That means I have to increase the input capacitor by two to keep the values the same. 
So I'm using 2.2 microfarad capacitors to keep the cutoff about the same. One potentiometer installed. Now that isn't really going to be enough to hold it in place, maybe. So I am going to do a little extra later on. I'll bridge these potentiometers to each other. Um, when you're using parts that do physically connect to the panel and you need to use some other strategy to connect other parts to the panel like this, you can use the physically connected ones, build up some 3D filament around them, and then extend that to the parts you want to stay put. could use more of that glue to stick stuff in place. I have done that in the past before I had the 3D pen. Um, but then you run the risk of your parts that have to physically move, like buttons. I guess every part that goes through the panel physically moves besides lights. So you run the risk of the physically moving parts getting stuck by the glue. Something I do in many of my circuits, especially the modules that have Arduinos in them, I will use a potentiometer like this, and I will make a little box for the potentiometer to sit in. I'll make the hole for the shaft a little larger, and I will put a button on the bottom of the potentiometer, so when you push the... Oh, I just messed it up. So when you push the potentiometer, it can perform a button function. That's how my uh, trigger sequencers work. I have some reverb modules that I built using the spin conduct spin semiconductor FV1. Oh, it's pretty sweet. Although the ones I got are damaged, so whatever. And I'm just making it stronger. stretch this over here, put it under the part that physically mounts, that bolts to the panel. That'll be nice and strong, and then I'll create a beam to there. Okay, potentiometer's in place. Time for wiring.
this 40 conductor IDE cable. It's so easy to store. So easy to strip, to pull apart. I just realized I haven't been wearing glasses this whole time. My reading glasses. Oh, that's so much better. Oh, man. Like night and day. rested my hand against the nozzle of my 3D pen and it's not hot like a soldering iron but it's hot a little bit hot there is my nice solid ground connection and then I need to put a ground there Yeah. stranded wire like this and poke a hole between the strands and then put your pins like that <laughs> that's a touch of overkill but yeah why not right all right now I got the grounds to all the potentiometers the next step is to put the input capacitors between the other end of the potentiometer and the actual inputs. The ground side of the polarized electrolytic capacitors goes toward the closest ground. Now, Sometimes, well, many of the signals that you plug into this circuit will be bipolar. They'll be going flipping between positive and negative. And I've never really heard why um, it is okay to treat capacitors like this. I 
think the idea is that the voltage is generally small enough and um, transient enough. It's not lots of current trying to go into the wrong side of a polarized capacitor. And I've never had a capacitor blow up in an audio circuit. Keep your leads nice and short. to use this as a input mixer for one of my reverb modules that I have only one input to, actually two inputs. This will allow me to expand that to a total of, I guess, five inputs. But um, then I can connect, for instance, a noise source, like some kind of really cool, <laughs> shimmery, warbly noise, and have it plugged into one of these inputs all the time. And then when I want a burst of interesting sound that's going through this reverb, uh, this reverb effect. 
if I can just hit it and go bing, that was crazy reverby. Oh my gosh. For my knife. Good dark techno. That little noise burst can just be transcendent. build a reverb module on here if you're making it this far and you have an idea of what kind of module you want me to build reverb module voltage controlled amplifier PT2399 delay those can be a lot of fun Tell me about it in the comments. Okay. Now I have all the grounds done, all the input capacitors wired up. Check. 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 Now I need the input resistors. I need four of these bad boys. pin of the four potentiometers. One, two, three, and a four. Then I'm going to, going to attach the resistors. One, two, This is the zero volt point of the active mixer circuit. There's my small bit of, oh wait a second, forgot to mark off the parts that I added. 20k, 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 and fake 20, well, not drawn 20k. Now if you look at it, we have all the input side built. We have the feedback resistor, the active part built. Now all I need to do is tie them together. That's what I'm doing with this tiny little piece of wire goes to the, <clears throat> pardon me, the frog in my throat, goes to the inverting, the inverting input of the op amp, good. 
other side. jack to install. If you ever buy RCA jacks like this, I hope you get jacks with smaller nuts. The previous several hundred of these jacks that I bought had small nuts that could fit. screwdriver with that kind of thing. I could just turn it like that. But I don't have, but they're too big now. I don't really know why. What's the advantage? It's more metal, more material. They're going to by necessity be more expensive. Take up more space on the back of my panel. Come on, people. Now I need a small value to protect the output. Since I wrote 680K, I may as well use a 680K resistor. short. Alright, the output protecting resistor connects to the output pin of this op amp. Now, those of you, those of us, have built circuits on perf board and strip board and all kinds of board, even PCBs, might get confused as I frequently did when looking at the underside of circuits, thinking about the pin out of any particular chip. And that could be really, really confusing. It could mess me up. And I have burned out many um off amps by thinking I was wiring the power correctly when really what I was doing was connecting the output and the <laughs> these two pins to ground and or to the positive and negative rails. Bad idea, don't do that. I uh oh jeez. I try to I want you know when you build everything out in the open, it's easy to remember that you're looking at the underside of a looking at the bottom of this NE5532 op amp and you can see a little notch right there so that's the north end of the chip so then it's easy to remember that this is the positive voltage this is the negative voltage and uh, this is well in this case this is the ground not all circuits have a connection to ground 
or not all chips do, but this one does. They will always be ground referenced somewhere, but it might not be right next to, not might not be right next to the chip. synthesizer out of storage where I store it and I'm going to wire it up mess made a mess Tips get pretty hot, but if you hustle, you can touch them with your fingers. Now, of course, 3D filament is not electrically conductive. Mm, I wonder if they can make it electrically conductive, but they can. Fill it with graphite particles. That'd be pretty cool. Okay, I got my synth out, here it is. And here is a power cable that is running into the wiring mess on the back of my synthesizer. Obviously, it's not powered on right now. Otherwise, I would be being careful. Um, for my synth, white, is ground. I'm gonna... it's not a good idea to put all of your power wires to something that's fairly fragile like a floating microchip. Well not really floating, there's these bits of uh, filament holding it in place. So this is completely temporary. I will make this better. I will attach um, a ground wire to one of the jacks, like maybe that one. And then I will attach the jack also to the positive input pins, the in non-inverting input pins of the op amp that need to be grounded, both of them. All right, so then this green in my synth is minus voltage, and that goes to the pin number four of the op amp, which since, I'm, since we're looking at the underside of it, and the notch is up here, it's right there. The positive is in my synth this orange or um, sometimes I use brown color but that color. All of my power rails are done with network cables. These are single strand category 5 network cables that I take apart and you know you can get 100 foot long network cables and longer for cheap or free, and you disassemble them, <laughs> strip all the wires from each other, they're twisted pair, so you end up with quite a mess. Oh, look at that, I have this free. This is not gonna work. This is my ground wire. <gasps> I'll do it right now. Okay, so here's my ground. I'll use this one right here. I'll attach my ground to there. That way, when 
the power wire might get jerked on or pulled on, this is where all that physical uh, stress goes to a really strong part of the module. It's not jerking on the chip, which is sort of barely connected to the rest of the circuit through the 3D filament. Not ideal. So, this is a good solid ground. The other end of this wire is connected to a good solid ground over here with that um, jack. So, if I connect this to the op amp, that'll connect all my grounds together. I've talked in other videos about star grounding. This is not a star ground. This is the opposite of a star ground. It's a, uh, what's the opposite of a star? Now the circuit's finished. And we can turn on my synthesizer. And hopefully it doesn't blow up. We have avoided smoke. That's good. All right, now let's get some sound out of my synthesizer. Okay, here's one sound. Put that over here. Okay, that's another sound. I don't want to have three. All right, let's do a drum beat. Let's do a snare. Just a snare roll, which is not coming through because, there we go.
quick. Turn all the inputs down. Here's one of them. Here's number two. Number two. Here's the snare roll from where you caught the other side of that snake. And here's whatever this is. Let's see if we got anything. Yep. 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 Total success. Hit like and subscribe and hit the bell. Leave a comment. Let me know what circuit you want me to build next.